Weather is the state of the atmosphere, described by, for instance, its temperature, air pressure, wind and precipitation. The Earth's atmosphere is only a very thin layer around our planet, and most weather occurs in just a thin layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. Weather on Earth is driven by the influx of radiation from the Sun, heating the atmosphere, oceans as well as the soil. This causes differences in temperature and differences in density of the air, which causes air to start moving. Without these differences, nothing exciting would happen. This lesson focuses on how these changes in temperature and pressure cause the air to start moving and in what way. Let's first look at what happens on a global scale. This simulation shows the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. On the left, the orbit of the Earth is viewed from the northern hemisphere. The size of the Earth and the Sun are not drawn to scale. You can see that the orbit of the Earth is nearly circular. Also, the axis of the Earth is tilted relative to the plane in which the Earth orbits the Sun. At the top right, you see the Earth viewed from the equator, with the rays of light coming from the Sun. Bottom right shows you how these rays of sunlight impact the Earth at the position of the person in the top right panel. That person is located on the latitude of Amsterdam. Right now it's winter in Amsterdam. The sunlight impacts the surface of the Earth at a small angle. So each square meter of Earth's surface receives only a small amount of energy. Now let's move forward in time. As you can see, in March, the Sun is directly above the equator. On our latitude, this means that the rays of sunlight impact the Earth at a larger angle, so per square meter we receive more energy. Now, at the end of June, the Sun is directly above the 23rd parallel north. At our latitude, the Sun is high up in the sky and the rays of sunlight are at their largest angle to the surface, so each square meter receives a large amount of energy. That's why in summer it's, well, summer. As it happens, for summer in the northern hemisphere, the Earth is furthest from the Sun. Summer is explained by the larger angle the Sun makes with the surface in summer in our hemisphere, so it's not explained by the distance Earth-Sun. Let's look at this cycle again, but now from the side. You can see that in the summer, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the Sun, and in the autumn, the Sun is above the equator, and now in winter, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun. So that's explaining the same thing. Around the equator, the Earth receives most energy per square meter from the Sun. The temperature of the surface increases and starts to radiate in the infrared. This radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere, from bottom up. The air temperature rises and its density drops. This hot air will be lighter and start to rise. In a weather context, this rising of air is called convection. Now suppose the Earth did not rotate around its axis, had no water at its surface, and its axis would not be tilted. Then the air from the equator would slowly cool down and would sink back to the Earth's surface near the poles, which results in a high-pressure system there. The air would then flow along the Earth's surface from this high-pressure region back to the low-pressure system around the equator. In weather context, this horizontal movement of air is called advection. In the end, you would get two grand cells of flowing air, one on the northern hemisphere and one on the southern hemisphere. This drawing shows you what actually does happen to the atmospheric circulation. First of all, the rotation of the Earth around its axis breaks up these two cells. The air will sink at about 30 degrees north and south, creating a high pressure system there. And a low pressure system will emerge at about 50 to 60 degrees north and south. Another difference is that there are temperature variations between land and sea, which will affect the flow of air. I will come back to that later in the video. Finally, due to the rotation of the Earth, air does not follow in a straight line from high to low pressure. Due to, to the Coriolis effect, the air will deviate from its straight line. In the northern hemisphere, moving along with the airflow, the air deviates to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, moving along with the airflow, the air deviates left. This has to do with conservation of angular momentum. Think of a figure skater making a pirouette. When the skater moves in her arms, nearer to the axis of rotation, she speeds up. Remember that the Earth is spinning too. It moves towards the east, in this diagram, to the right. Look at the air flowing from the 30th parallel north, indicated by the green arrows. 
this air moves north, and as it does, it also moves nearer to the axis of the Earth. So it speeds up. It catches up with the Earth and moves east faster. So it deviates to the right. You can work this out yourselves for the other arrows in the same manner. In a high and low pressure system, something similar happens. In this drawing, the L indicates a low pressure system, also called a low or a cyclone. The H indicates a high pressure system, also called an high or anti-cyclone. The lines indicate points of equal pressure, called isobars. Iso for the same and bars for pressure. So the inner circle around the high indicates points with a pressure of 1028 millibars. Now without rotation of the earth, the air would flow directly from high to low, or perpendicular to the isobars as shown. Let's look at one such arrow indicating the flow of air. Due to the rotation of the earth on the northern hemisphere, the flow of air deviates to the right. So it picks up speed perpendicular to its direction of motion. Furthermore, near the surface of the earth, the air slowed down a bit. So in its normal direction of motion, it slows down. As a result, air flows counterclockwise around a low and clockwise around a high pressure system. On the southern hemisphere, this is reversed. This picture shows a low over Iceland. You can see the clouds spiral counterclockwise towards the low. This picture shows a low located south of Australia. Now the air spirals clockwise around the low. If we go back to the picture of the global weather system, you can see that at a low, air moves up in the atmosphere and will flow back towards the low along the surface of the Earth. And if you think of it, this makes sense because of the conservation of mass. The air cannot be destroyed or created. At a high, something similar happens. Here the air flows away from the high and is replaced by air from higher layers of the atmosphere. This has an important effect on weather. Lows are characterized by rising air which cools, water vapor condenses forming clouds, and from these clouds precipitation may fall. Highs are characterized by sinking air which heats up, water vapor in the air evaporates and clouds disappear. So a high is characterized by fair weather. I'll return to this effect in a later lesson. I haven't explained the effect of water on wind systems. The major difference is that land is heated more easily than water masses. That's because only the top layer of land is heated, while sunlight penetrates water to great depths, heating more mass. So during the day, the air above land has a higher temperature than above, for example, the sea. As we've seen before, the air will rise, leaving a lower pressure behind. Air from sea will come in to replace it. This wind is called a sea breeze. During the night, the opposite happens. Land cools off more easily than the sea, Air above land will cool as well, sinking back down. This pushes the air away from the land towards sea, where the air is relatively warm and less dense and rises. This wind is called a land breeze. So we've seen how air starts to move due to differences in temperature. We started from a global scale, looking at the global circulation of air. Then in more detail, air flows around high and low pressure systems in a characteristic way. Due to the Coriolis effect on the northern hemisphere, air flows clockwise around a high and counterclockwise around a low pressure system. Finally, where land and water masses meet, you can get even more detailed flow of air that can be very local as well as temporal, as it changes between day and night. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. In the next two lessons we will look at evaporation and condensation and at how clouds form.